Good evening. My name is Kim Motes. I'm the program manager of the Performance Plus program. And on behalf of the Kennedy Center, I'd like to welcome you to the Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Festival's panel, The Musical Artistry of Mary Lou Williams. We're delighted to have with us this evening Valerie Capers, musician and leader of the Valerie Capers Trio, which is performing Saturday night. Father Peter O'Brien, executive director of the Mary Lou Williams Foundation and former manager of Mary Lou Williams. And Dr. Billy Taylor, musician and Kennedy Center artistic advisor for jazz. Please welcome our panel. What I thought, I would introduce these tunes very briefly like a um, radio host and the two musicians, the people who know about the music from the inside, will comment musically on it. We're going to hear two things, both solo piano. One um, recorded in 1977, the standard, Vernon Duke's I Can't Get Started, with lyrics by Ira Gershwin, but Mary Lou doesn't sing. So just piano. And this was played after uh, she faced Cecil Taylor for two hours on the Carnegie Hall stage. And there's something very lifting about this. It's a little different from the way she ordinarily played. And we're going to segue immediately into her very first solo piano recording in 1930. So 1977, 1930, I Can't Get Started, and Nightlife.
47 years back now. First record, 1930. the two pianists to talk now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I to go first? Bill? Sure. Uh, those two examples, I think, are really extraordinary to start with. Um, Duke once said that uh, um, Mary Lou was just timeless in the way she played. Uh, there's 47 years between those two musical examples, and you hear what she did the last uh, one we just heard, listened to in uh, 1930. Here was a woman who grew up, as she said, listening to Fats Waller and uh, uh, J.P. Johnson, old Jelly Roll Morton, had a complete, not only technically, but spiritually, emotionally, a complete concept of what she was doing, mastered it, and played the hell out of it. And then then uh, you see there in 77, one of the other great things about, I think, Mary Lou's playing is that she really loved the piano and she had an enormous concept of how to use the piano. She was powerful in the playing, but she understood about what an orchestra the piano really is uh, and how she dealt with, uh, as we heard and I can't get started, the pedal sonorities and the way she would work with the arpeggios and, and uh, harmonic colors. She really understood how to make the keyboard sound, and um, it's wonderful, I think. Unquestionably. Uh, I was interested in the uh, second one for several reasons. First of all, she told me uh, that uh, she had played for Jelly Roll Morton when she was a young, very young girl. <laughs> And he really slapped her down, and he slapped everybody down. He said that, uh, you young players don't know what to do with breaks. And so as you could hear in that first record, she figured out what to do with a break. I mean, she did, and so she had, uh, and she all, uh, do it for the rest of her life, she was very, that was something that really stung her. She really was very upset when he told her that. And she really, uh, 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 when she wrote breaks for bands or anything, I mean, she's very careful. She made sure that it, it, it rhythmically and harmonically did whatever it was she was trying to say. 
the second one really fascinated me because uh, when I first heard, heard Earl Garner, he sounded just like that. And, and he uh, had obviously been highly influenced by uh, um, uh, Mary Lou because he'd come from Pittsburgh and he'd grown up. He was a kid when she was playing uh, with Andy Kirk and other bands. And uh, he had listened to her, although he never said uh, as much. Uh, obviously, he listened to that. Uh, uh, those are many of the devices that he used. And uh, uh, she had been using them. Hearing her do it there, I'd heard her do it uh, uh, for many years. She played uh, that particular tune in a way not that different from uh, what we heard on record. Uh, um, in a show in 19, it must have been about 1945 or something like that, called Blue Holiday. And she played a solo piano. And uh, I was in the pit band. And every night, she would get her hand like that in a ballad. And I thought that was just remarkable. I mean, because, you know, if you're playing something exciting, that's, that's, that's one thing. But she would play something, and then she'd just strike a chord or a note uh, uh, within people that were in her audience, and they'd respond. They, they, they'd applaud. They said, yeah, right, you know. She was a, a remarkable pianist. Uh, you also mentioned Andy Kirk, which leads us into the next uh, two selections. Um, Mary Lou joined, uh, well, uh, speaking of exciting things, they had a pianist, Andy Kirk had a pianist named Marion Jackson Mann, who uh, sometimes got lost, you know, here and there. And um, they'd send for Mary Lou to play something exciting like Froggy Bottom or a Boogie Woogie, and it was on a record date in Chicago, right around this time when you heard Nightlife that the guy didn't show up. and. John, her husband, said, my wife plays a little piano. And from that point on, and several other things like that, she got to be the um, resident pianist with Andy Kirk. We're going to hear two of the things she wrote for him and recorded in 1936 and one in 1938. First is Walking and Swinging, which is the one she most often referred to. And there was a television show called Swinging the Blues. And Billy Taylor was a commentator and a guest in the middle. And he played a chorus of that. And also Twinkling, which is a uh, piano feature for her. So we hear two Andy Kirk things, both by Mary Lou Williams, and she's at the piano. Play them together, nice and full. <laughs> Thank you. 
She uses uh, in the first one a device that uh, uh, is to be um, a very important part of Charlie Parker's uh, style, that of going up a half step uh, and sort of creating some tension. And she does, does it in the melody uh, of, of that tone. And uh, 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 she does all of the writing uh, is like uh, the scoring of a, a solo. She just exactly. wrote out a solo. So this is if I was going to play a solo, I'd play this. And so she gave it to all of the uh, 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 other instruments. And it's interesting how she employs the Kansas City call and response and, and all of those things. So eight bars of this, and she puts it all together. It's a nice little package. And, and in that first one, what's so interesting about what Billy is saying, I realize I'm the only one up here who never had the privilege of meeting or working with her here. Yeah. Uh, but when you're talking about that first selection also, knowing later, for example, of her uh, close, you might have noticed this, Billy, of her close relationship with a, a monk sure. and so forth and so on. When this uh, first tune, Walking and Swinging, um, uh, modulates from A to F. She mm -hmm. has a lick in there that bum bum bum, dee da da, ba da. Yeah, no, Monk just turned it around yeah. a little later, a few years later, later, and it became rhythm rhythming, you know. Yeah, right. So it, there it was, right there, you know. Sure. There it was, right there. And uh, in the second one, Billy, how did you feel about this? I noticed that. Um, you know, when we think about that time in the 30s and the 40s when Father Hines used to talk about the fact that he wanted to extend his playing to make his right hand sound like an instrument. He talked about Louis Armstrong and the trumpet and all. Um, uh, Mary Lou, he was playing wonderful single lines with the right hand. The thing I found, though, about her lines is that they were always with a, such a sense of pianism, you know, the, the, the piano and really uh, the, the lines were, I, I felt always very pianistic, very keyboard, very, very suitable to the instrument, to the sound somehow. Well, she had, uh, by that time, uh, absorbed uh, much of what Earl Hines had done. And yes. Is, uh, uh, you can hear the same kind of influence in uh, Hines' in influence in all of the things that we've played so far, mm -hmm. uh, where he's playing, uh, uh, she's using octaves. Yes. And she, yes. Us she uses those in just the way you're talking about. Yes. Instead of sounding like someone playing a, a very large, with the hand fully opening, playing something like she's doing it very easily mm -hmm. and, and as though she's doing it with the single finger. Mm -hmm. and so, so the phrase, as you, as you point out, is very pianistic. Yes. Gary Giddens thought that she had conservatory training, and she said, indeed not. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, never had a lesson in her life. I think maybe later on, listen to somebody, but uh, he thought that because of the way she uh, touched the keys. Yeah, she had a great and, touch. Um, mm -hmm. She said, hug the keys to a student. She played with her hands very flat. So they just ripple across and they're very smooth. She, she and Art Tatum were the only two people I ever heard make the piano sound that way and play, playing with, with the finger flat. It's hard to do because you don't, you don't have the leverage if, if your hand is, is, is uh, if your knuckles are, are bent and, you, and you're doing this, you have that leverage. Yeah. If you don't, you're playing flat. It's harder. Yeah, sometimes you can use the flat hand for certain effects. I know sure. sometimes in impressionistic music you can, but sure. not as a general thing. You're right. It's yeah. not um, it's a basic. She liked that second chorus, too. <clears throat> she only had uh, three reeds, and she heard four notes. Andy Kirk said, you can't do that. Put a six <laughs> in the chord. It's against the rules. And she said, well, that's what I hear. So she put a trumpet in a hat. Yeah. And uh, she liked that. She always re referred to that chorus the second time through the tune. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah, she was, she was uh, in turn, as, a, as an arranger, she was uh, doing things that uh, uh, Benny Carter and, and uh, Don Redmond were pioneering. And she took uh, things that she heard them do and, and did it from another point of view. Mm -hmm. She was very crazy about Don Redmond. Yeah. Matter of fact, toward the end of her life, when she couldn't play anymore and was bedridden, uh, oh, she was writing an arrangement of uh, G, Baby, and I Good to You. Yeah. <laughs> so she was Great going job. back to the beginning. Great job. And, and kind it of is. pulling it back. <laughs> okay. This next thing is uh, from 1945, and uh, the year that uh, Billy referred to, when uh, Billy was in the pit band and Mary on the stage in Blue Holiday. That same year, she recorded the Zodiac Suite for Moash at Folkways Records. Um, the first incarnation was uh, one a week on her radio show on WNEW called the Mary Lou Williams Piano Workshop. The second incarnation of the suite was in the uh, recording studio for Folkways. And tonight, we will hear um, an alternate take. I think uh, Mo Ash issued the first thing he got. You know, he got that first cookie, you know, that first round disc. That's what he put out. This is um, 
better, I think. And this was put on the new CD by the Smithsonian Folkways in the primary spot. So this is Virgo, and it has a terrific spooling up and down in it. So Virgo, very short, two and a half minutes, so listen. My sign. <laughs> <laughs> She has uh, most of the uh, things that uh, many pianists of that time were wrestling with, including me. Uh, and that's uh, wanting to play bebop lines, but not wanting to relinquish uh, the pianistic aspects of the left hand. And so it, uh, uh, until we figured it out, it was a dichotomy <laughs> between the, the rhythmic aspect of what you're doing in the left hand and, and what you were doing uh, in the right hand. So essentially, you're playing two styles simultaneously. Yeah. That's one of the things I found interesting about it. It's 1945, and uh, you smile because you, just as Billy said, you, you feel, you, you can hear that she's, uh, you know, um, moving toward breaking out uh, from the confines of uh, rhythmic, rhythmic and melodic lines, harmonies, even form to some degree. And yet, uh, when she did start to improvise, you felt when the bass was moving, you were still a bit anchored to the old traditions of rhythm. So you, you hadn't quite broken away yet, you know. But you can hear, you can actually hear what's coming in three, four, five years. And it's very, very interesting. Well, both of, both of those uh, musicians, Jack the Bear and Al Lucas, were uh, out of the swing era. Yes. And so they were, they were doing the kind of thing that they had done with all kinds all of swing lives. groups and pre-bop yes. groups and so forth. <laughs> right. And so she was, she was stuck with that, <laughs> yes. that, that feeling, even though she was trying to do something else. <laughs> but you can hear, you know, sure. <laughs> right? you can just hear what's, what's happening and where it's all going to eventually go. It's, it, that's what makes, I think, this, this composition quite interesting. To, to the, the thing that, that, that interested me in her playing during that period, uh, she played at Cafe Society a lot uh, downtown in the village. And Joe Jones would come down sometimes and sit in with her. And also, um, uh, what's his name, the drummer from uh, uh, Detroit, uh, wonderful drummer. Uh, oh, yeah, I know um, who you mean. Uh, he played with Teddy Wilson, played yes, with a lot of, yes, lot of yeah. oh. Anyway, I'll, I'll think of his name in a minute. At any rate, he, like Joe Jones, uh, was, had a much more flexible rhythm. And he would do things that 
uh, allowed her to do things like this uh, uh, a little more in the context of what uh, was going to become the Vogue uh, with Dizzy and Bird. Right. Right. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, we'll move two uh, years ahead to 1947, and this is an all-women group. And um, nobody knew this existed. I think Bridget O'Flynn, the drummer, had these acetates at home. Because these two sides of what, what, what one that we're going to hear, just an idea, is a reworking of a thing called Mary's Idea, which he first recorded in 1930 with Andy Kirk and then in 1938 with Andy Kirk. And then in 1948, Benny Goodman recorded it trying to play Bob. <laughs> Anyhow, um, <laughs> these two, um, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, <laughs> but these two, Mary Lou got him playing Bob. She wrote a tune called <laughs> Benny's Bop, and he also recorded Just an Idea with her and also with Teddy Wilson. So exactly what you were talking about could be listened to and seen where it made it and where it didn't. Anyhow, uh, this is an all-women group, and um, the origin of the date is unknown. I think Miss O'Flynn had the sides in her house because she's credited. They were released on what looked like a plastic radio with seven or eight CDs in it from Mercury, had mostly rhythm and blues people on it, and two Mary Lou Bop things with women. And the uh, guitarist is the great Mary Osborne. So this is uh, a little more toward the modern idea, uh, just an idea. Let's see how this sounds. She solved one problem by making, uh, by having the drums recorded so softly <laughs> that uh, you were not even aware it was there until the drum break. But uh, 
the guitar fascinated me because I didn't realize how much Mary Osmond sounded like John Collins and J Jimmy Shirley and some of the guitarists who worked with Nat Cole in those days. Uh, what I thought was so interesting about uh, this particular selection um, is Mary's, um, Mary Lou's concept of the, the composition itself. Um, the, uh, well, she, she has some of that, of course, now by this time, the bebop humor and the uh, sort of maybe sometimes unpredictability in the way a cadence may fall. But it's interesting that the tune itself is, uh, uh, the head of the tune is a common song form with uh, 32 bars. And then uh, when they improvise, they improvise over a 12-bar form. And it's interesting when the last chorus of the blues, when they come out with a, a unison bebop line, if you will, and uh, then, of course, bringing it to the end with the uh, statement of the eight bars again. I thought that was rather um, inventive of her, you know, in yeah. putting that composition together that way. She had a lot of trouble finding good rhythm people. You always did. Very uh, hard to Well, she was, she was very hard on bass players because uh, she wanted uh, uh, specific things in the bass clef because she wanted to uh, use certain harmonic uh, textures. And if you change the bass note, you change the chord. So, so she said, play these notes. And a lot of guys uh, rejected that and <laughs> wouldn't do something else, and she'd be furious. An inconsistency in work, too. In other words, if uh, when I first met her, uh, you were also in the Hickory House off and on, you could get long residencies, but not always. And then this bass player, that bass player, you couldn't keep a musician if you didn't get paid very well and couldn't retain somebody. So. This was an ad hoc kind of thing, too. Leonard Feather had an idea in 1946, all women. Yeah. And uh, so here you are, stuck, instead of your bass player or something. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the that would sound like player. with. Um, the, the bass player on here was a good bass player. She had, uh, uh, well, in time, because she wasn't playing with uh, a lot of the other guys, but she had, uh, uh, she played the lines. Yeah. And what, what, uh, uh, Mary Lou liked about it. She was playing the right bass notes for her chords. <laughs> yeah, and Mary was a composer yeah. often. She yeah. really had the whole yeah, thing right. in mind. This next thing has uh, never been heard by anybody because it was, has never been released. In 1962, Mary uh, re founded her own company, Mary Records. Nobody was recording her, and she wanted to record her own music. And uh, this is a tune she did record in 1954 for a small label in France. Uh, the one thing that, um, oh my goodness, Williams picked for the Smithsonian History of Jazz Piano, it's called Nicole, but this is 10 years later in an unreleased um, version, and uh, Percy Heath is on bass and Tim Kennedy on drums. Could you turn the bass down just a smidgen? It's banging too much. Thanks, okay. <laughs>
when she recorded this, we had been working together uh, opposite one another for a long time. She had, uh, um, we had worked at the composer, and uh, well, before that, we worked at the downbeat, and we worked opposite one another in the composer. And uh, uh, it was fascinating to listen to uh, the kinds of things. She had so many bass lines that were, the whole tune was a bass line. She'd, she'd write a bass line, then she'd improvise over whatever it was. And uh, she just had dozens of those things. She just, just to make them up on the, on the spur of the moment. And uh, uh, she always had good bass players who could, who could hear that. And she'd do it the second time around, the guy would catch it. And it would, they, that would be a new tune. God, I wish I'd heard some of that in person. <laughs> um, for me, I'll tell you what knocks me out on this particular selection. Um, it, it doesn't matter whether you're playing a, an adagio movement from a Beethoven sonata, whether you're, you're playing a blues of this nature. One of the hardest things to do is to play slowly and to be able to, to have a pacing that holds the music together. I mean, there are stretches in there where you can just be stripped bare and to be able to, to keep the sound going, to be able to keep an idea with real feeling and emotion uh, 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 you know, continuous and keep a continuity that says something, that means something, that feels something, when you hear it, is not an easy thing to do. And she certainly, she, she, does, it, she does it in this. Uh, it may have a lot to, to say, that, that may have a lot to say with what she was spiritually and what the blues meant to her, uh, both, both um, you know, as a pianist and as a creative artist. But being able to hold something like this together, this tempo, make it interesting to listen, make it emotionally satisfying, and, and you feel earthy, it's, it's earthy, it's, it's there, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a tremendous thing to be able to do. I like it too. Beautiful. Um, use, use a perfect word, uh, spiritually. Um, she went through um, maybe a devastating few years in her mid-40s, about six or eight years before this. And right before the period when she began to come back, back out again and play opposite you, she liked the composer room very much, by the way. And she told me a story. She said to the guy, who owned the place, well, if you want me in here, get somebody good opposite me. Get Billy Taylor. This <laughs> <laughs> could be a challenge. Yeah. So, uh, Cy Barron was the guy. Yeah, she, right. So she wanted somebody she could inspire her. Um, and vice versa. So, so really, I wish I could. That's the only club she ever said she liked. Yeah. So I loved it in the composer room. Anyway. Well, the thing um, about it was, for her, was that it was, a very, it was the most intimate club uh, uh, that I remember in New York, because Cy Barron and uh, I forget the other guy, Willie uh, Shore, his parent partner, partner uh, wanted to make that club as different from the Embers as they, as they could. The Embers was a very chic and very noisy club, and so they made sure that uh, anyone who came there, this was a piano room, this was a room where you came to listen. They didn't make announcements or anything like that, but uh, if you did make noise, they, you, you were escorted out without a check. I mean, you just, just get out. And, and so it was one of the few clubs that I know that, that uh, really, they didn't make a big deal out of it, but people like Sinatra and, and Elizabeth Taylor, a lot of stars would come over, and, and they would protect them. You couldn't, you know, people weren't running over looking for autographs or anything. They came in, they listened, they left, you know. Anyway, she went through a very uh, difficult period just before that, which led to a religious conversion. and. Uh, uh, Valerie used the word spiritual, and um, she spent a large part of the last 25 or 30 years of her life trying to convince everybody this was spiritual music, and uh, people who would think about it in other ways. The next selection is uh, uh, one of the results of her con religious conversion. This is the, her setting for the Lord's Prayer. The vocalist you will hear appears tonight in Jazzberry Jam, and also the bass player you hear appears tonight in Jazzberry Jam and they're the same woman. Uh, Carlene Ray plays bass and sings on this. David Amram plays French horn and Al Hare with drums. It's very beautiful. It Mary Lou's uh, setting for the Our Father. At the very end, you'll hear a small snippet with a small chorus. It's one of the Beatitudes.
This particular piece just absolutely knocks me out. I wish I'd written it myself. <laughs> you know, it's a wonderful piece of music. Uh, what I think is so extraordinary about it, first of all, the, um, the vocal line is very lyrical, extremely vocal, very beautifully written with a real sense of how to write for the voice. Um, what's extraordinary, I think, about this piece, it's really and truly, without any question, as you listen to it, an African-American composition, or if you will, quote, a jazz composition, unquote. There's nothing about it that's Italian, French, German, European. The, the figure in the bass, the quiet uh, fill-ins with the drums, the chord harmonies, the clusters, all of that uh, is all part of... Uh, I guess her background, all part of the African tradition of this music, and I think it's an absolute gem. And of course, the end, bringing in the, uh, the idea of the Beatitudes, the blessed are the peacemakers, is extremely creative and very inventive. I, I think it's a wonderful composition and says a lot about her creativity as a composer, which I think should be a very seriously uh, considered right along with the, the uh, piano prowess. The thing that uh, uh, interested me and everything that she did uh, was the same kind of uh, um, care in which she wrote the bass lines. Uh, mm -hmm. She took as much uh, time writing bass lines as she did melody. She wanted that uh, part of her music to uh, uh, really be very clear, clearly stated so that you hear these moving lines with the melody going one way and the bass line going another way, but complementing one another mm -hmm. in, in a way that, though it is uh, African-American, uh, is very similar to what Bach did. True, but still the sound is particularly oh, the sound. No, this. I, I yeah. wasn't yeah. disagreeing with yeah. you at all. It's, yeah. uh, You're absolutely, right. You're you know. right. She had a lot of, uh, she wanted uh, the accent on African-American. She very mm -hmm. often said that it's mm -hmm. not created here. This is the one time I heard her use the word African about the meter. Mm -hmm. oh, she used that word. I remember her speaking about this composition like that. Oh. So it's very nice to hear you say that. It brings back a memory. OK? Sure. Um, another uh, composition for big band. She didn't stop writing for big band. For instance, there's a woman in the audience tonight who works for the Duke Ellington Collection here at the Smithsonian. And they have retrieved and located and identified 29 different big band arrangements, we think, for Duke Ellington by Mary Lou Williams, only four or five of which have been recorded, we think, plus other uh, pieces that are up at the uh, Institute of Jazz Studies. She continued to write for big band off and on. It's a couple of very beautiful things for Benny Goodman in the late 40s. This was written in 1968, uh, intended for Duke Ellington, but she recorded it when she went to Denmark to open a club for Timmy Rosencrantz and wound up recording with the Danish National Radio Jazz Band. We hope this gets out on CD sooner or later too, but you're hearing something nobody's heard except over there almost 30 years ago. It's called New Musical Express. Short. <laughs> Fast. <laughs>
Hardly still. sounded like Duke Ellington. <laughs> still riding those brakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She wrote uh, that last, when the whole band was playing, sounded yeah. like some of Duke's chords. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> we got Just, a surprise for you. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, one more tune. Uh, recorded in 1968 in Denmark with a very great bass player, Niels Henning Orsted Peterson, and a Danish drummer. It's for you. Tilbage til trioen Mary Williams, Nils Henning Rosenkrantz, og William Schöpfe, der spiller Grand Night for Swing. Grand Night for Swing. <laughs> this is Billy's composition. She played this all the time, and at almost every set. Bring the volume up. here and say the boys and I will take a short break and be back with you soon. <laughs> it's about the fourth term tune I heard her play. The first night I heard her play. I was really honored because with all of the music that she wrote for her, she used to use it as a theme. And with all of the music that she wrote for her to use that as a theme, I was very flattered and you know, very nice of her. I just got the cutoff sign. Okay, thanks.